we're at the point of starting our d design and starting to weave and everything was worth it. We spent a lot of time uh, paying careful attention to the tension, correct tension of the warp and the, uh, the putting on the edging cord, spacing it out evenly and right now we're at a point of starting our design. It seems like it takes a long time to get it right, but I can tell you from experience that having rushed through a few projects, you pay for it in the end. It's much better to spend the time now and get it right. We're going to uh, put a solid stripe down here, and after the stripe, we're going to put in seven squares, just like our, our project. When we were doing our warping, we actually planned how many squares we were going to have. We're going to start counting right here. One, two, three, four, five, six sets, and six and a half sets for our squares. And go to the top, past the uh, lazy heddle, and tie your marker up here. So you know when you get back weaving up here, you know which ones to start with the squares. It's very important that you do that because if you have a long rug, you'll know where to start. And then you count the next set. One, two, three, four, five, six, six and a half sets. We're not going to tie this because we're going to tie the next section. Count your next set. One, two, three, four, five, six, six and a half. Go up and put your marker there. Count your next set. One, two, three, four, five, six and a half. We're not going to tie this one. Count your next set. One, two, three, four, five, six and a half. This one we're going to tie off again. One, two, three, four, five, six and a half. We're not going to tie this one and then see, ne count your next set. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have six and a half right here. So it works out <coughs> that we have six and a half sets for every square and we're going to have seven of them. Now Angie, this worked out perfectly. We planned this project ahead so our count is right on. But uh, what if somebody had, for instance, a half a set extra on each end, how would they work out their design? How would you approach that? If we had like maybe one set extra and, and, uh, and uh, we needed to put this someplace as opposed to just dropping these uh, sets right here, I would make the end squares wider by half a set. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to, you can have the middle square right here wider by one set, just adding half a set on each side and you'll have a, a wider base of the square right mm -hmm. here. You just added a set right here to your middle one. So you kind of distribute what you have extra into the other squares. Design. I yes. see. Okay, so we're going to... This is where this wooden needle is very important. We're going to start with this and wrap it around here over to the other side twist it around now are you doing this to speed up the process of stripes? Is yeah you can really speed up uh, your your stripes by doing by having this so we're going to be using the brown as a background I'll go ahead and put a lot on there. And when I'm going down, I'm twisting it as I'm doing it like this. 
mm -hmm. I'm twisting it and and right here to catch it you kind of put one extra turn right here go back down turn it you can use the wooden needle as a, a thin batten it's kind of like a multi-purpose tool here and and sometimes if you if you're working with a, a really wide um, rug and you have a long wooden needle you can make this longer too okay we're going to put in our first row the background of the uh, the rug which would be brown I'm starting with the brown and your my first row is is going to go in on the lazy shed bring these two together and the reason why you want to start with the lazy shed is down here see this crisscross right down here it brings the crisscross down here you want to start your first laying in your first weft on the crisscross of the uh, warp strings if you don't do it and 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 you start in with no shed no crisscross down here and you just lay this in like this and when you take it off it looks like it's just laying there sitting right on sitting right on the uh, edging cord you don't want to do that because you're going to have the 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 weft uh, the warp string showing it it's going to look toothy down mm -hmm. there now does it matter whether you start going this way or that side does that is that a personal preference it's or? a personal preference i usually I usually work in this direction, mm -hmm. but you can work in whatever direction, whatever your preference preference is, right there. Now you're and leaving my, that tail. I'm gonna weave little, leave a little tail out here, mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna start making bubbles with my weft. Now, why do you make? What do the bubbles do? The bubbles, uh, it, it, so you don't make it too tight. That's when your sides start when, pulling in. Yes, when you start with a really tight first line, you're already starting to pull your edge, edges in right here. So you want to make sure you have bubbles in there, and and you're not you're not too your weft string is not too loose or too tight. Mm -hmm. Just leave this out until I get, until I change my shed right here. And then I'm going to change my shed and use my pull. You alternate the pull shed and the lazy shed every time you put your weft string through. Now you're locking down your your edges right. to, to begin with. And then you do the bubbles. You can tell when when you have too much of a too much weft in here, it'll get it'll hang out. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go back go up like this and then do your bubbles again right here. And this tail right here, I'm just going to put it back in here so it's no longer showing. I see. Just a little tail right here. So I've noticed you've really taken care to pack these first rows down. Right. So that the uh, warp strings doesn't, doesn't show through. Right. Now on this particular project, we're going to do a uh, maybe um, a an inch or an inch and a half or two inches of nothing but solid stripe down here. Stripes have a tendency to pull in, don't they? I mean, right. More than a lot of other types of designs. Because you're working with one continuous uh, weft, mm -hmm. and if you're not careful with with um, packing down the edges right here, you're going to start going in. Mm -hmm. 
And I've learned not to make bubbles when I'm doing this. I have a, I have a feel for it going through my hands right. over here. But most um, of us I'm, can't do this. Right. Most of us need to have bubbles. bubbles. <laughs> Do the bubbles this row. Mm -hmm. You'll have a feel for after you do like um, three or four rows. You'll have a feel for how big the bubbles should be. Okay. Right here, when I'm, I'm I put my weaving fork down so that I pick this up, and my mother says the, a good weaver never puts down her weaving fork. So I should be holding this right here while I'm doing everything else. Now, show us what you're doing when you're strumming the warp there and why you do that. Let's see, which one did I do? I just, I just got out of, we just used this pool shed over here going this way. Mm -hmm. So I took this out, pushed this one down, and I strummed it across. When you strum your warp all the way across, it separates it if, it, okay. if they get caught right. someplace. So I strum it across to separate the, uh, the uh, warp strings and then insert my batten in the lazy shed. It looks like you're, you're inserting your batten right about in the middle. Is that right. intentional or? That, that's my working area right in there for now. Mm -hmm. Now, can you actually see it if you uh, catch uh, or don't catch a particular warp string? When you look at this, do you visually look at that to be sure that your warp is correct before you start weaving? I inserted my batten right here in the lazy shed. And I'm just visually checking to see that I didn't pick up any back warps. And right here, it seems like we have a problem right here. And uh, there's too many warps right bunched in right here, so I, I can visually tell that I picked up back warps. So I have to take this back out, strum some more, and put it back through. Do you find that on stripes that sometimes the the, at the edges, they begin to sink more, and you have to fill in the edges more or not? Uh, sometimes uh, it's, it sinks a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you have to watch uh, your edges. And you, uh, uh, when it sinks a little bit, you, you need to uh, fill in right there. So you don't want to start your design like a fourth of an inch and have problems up here. Mm -hmm. So you can start like with an inch and a half or two inches on your stripe, your finishing area. Mm -hmm. I'm beginning to notice a sinking area right here. Are you noticing I that? I see from it. That point? Yes, right there. A okay. little bit less over here, but certainly more here. So I have to, I have to break this brown weft. Make sure you don't. You, now when you break it, yeah. you have to kind of, you have to unroll it and just pull it apart so it has a tail like this. Very gently. Very gently. No snapping when you're breaking. In other words, if you just pull it tight without unrolling it, unrolling it, it will snap. Right. And you won't get a nice frayed edge. So I'm filling in right here. So you went over about 12 warps, right. 10, 12 warps. Change the shed, came Change around. the shed. Mm -hmm. Go back so I can pick this one up over here. and See, as opposed to using this, I'm going to do it by, with my hand. And it takes a longer time to work this through with your hand. You have to do it in a, either. Uh, and, and a, sec a section at a time, like this. Mm -hmm. Now I want to watch how you fill this carefully, because that can be sort of tricky.
You can either do it with the with the uh, batten stick like this because we we have a, a a dip. We need to put in like maybe three right here. Mm-hmm. Now we can either use the batten stick to change the shed each, each time or we can do it manually by hand and go like this and go to where you want to stop and fill and then go back in. Now if you do a second fill you don't turn on the same warp that no. you did on the first fill. Do you go another warp or two past that? Or Either past that or, or, uh, or two or four short of where you uh, stop the uh, uh, turn on the last uh, okay. warp. So I think that looks good. That looks good. Mm -hmm. We did the f uh, fill on the edges. Can you show us again how you picked up that warp? Okay manually this is the uh this is a, a spent shed in here mm -hmm. so to go in manually i pick up every other one from the back like this mm -hmm. gonna you have to be careful when you do that that you pick up every other one and don't drop one too i suppose right. I'm going to go one or two extra here. And then go back. I got through weaving an inch and a half of the border right here. So now we're going to start um, setting in the square. But before we do that, um, we're going to finish this last row in here. We did all our filling in uh, where we, we needed fill-ins. And uh, so this last row is just going to go right straight across. Looks really level. <clears throat> Very nice. That's where you want to be um, when you are going to start in, uh, in your stripe. Make sure your, your line is really straight. And then you're ready to start the, uh, we're ready to start the squares right here. And I'm just going to weave in this little tail right here so we don't leave it hanging out like that. Now we're ready to start our, our squares. What color do you plan to make the squares, Angie? Let's see here. I have the... Uh, I was thinking of making this the center square since we're going to have seven center and this one right here and this one here and white at the end so we have three on each side and this is going to be the center. Do you think you have enough contrast between uh, those two tan shades? Tan shades. Maybe not enough. Let me switch these two. No, that looks nice. What about like that? I like that. Mm -hmm. So we have a, we, we already chose our colors right here. Okay. And there's enough contrast between all the colors right <coughs> here is for, for it to show up. So I'm going to start laying in my colors right here. And I'm in the same shed that I did my last row in, and that's where I'm going to start my, my, uh, so you have not changed this. I have not changed, changed this the batten. shed. Okay. So I'm in still in the same shed that I did my last row right here. Okay. So this is the the first one here. Break off. Nice feathered in. And this is you don't pay attention to where where our markers are right here when you lay in the colors. So I just feather this in right here in the same shed. So it's laying right on top right. of the last row going laying in. Right the, on top. Going in the same direction that the right. last row went. And then my next color is white. And 
this is where your marker is important because this is where the white is going to go in. And just feather it in like this, my next color. So you have a very long feathered tail section that you're laying in. You're really right. not laying a full weft on top of there, are you? You pick up the next section. And then my center square with the... I like those colors. I like, like that. I like that color. Next section. Go back to going out with your brown hair. Go to your marker and get it down to the weaving part right here and feather it in. And then what do we have here? This is find your marked off area. Go down here and this is where you're going to put it in. And then the brown. How long a piece of weft are you using? You don't want to make it too long that they get tangled up. Mm -hmm. You you just want a, a, a about two feet or maybe less. two feet. Mm -hmm. Go in, find your marked off area, go down, and put this in. That's where, where my blocks is, are going to inter, interlock, interlock right here. Mm -hmm. Now I changed, changed the shed. Let me get these balls out of the way. Change my shed. On this row, we're going to start our interlocking between the two colors. And I'm going to start on this side and work this string against the next color and find my marked area down up here where I have the markers and put this through through the shed. Right here. And find the mark over here and my my next color is below the color that I just wove over in this area. So it's going to cross like this. So I go find this area, now my next marked off area, and put the white in here. So you actually have a join now right between two warp strings. Yes, this is what happened. I'm going to lift this up a little bit and there's it hap the interlock is between these two warp strings right here. I see. Right in here. For this next one, you find your marked off area and you do the same thing. The, the white one is on top of the, your next color. Put this one through, and you created another interlock between these two warp strings right here. The next one. The same thing. It's really handy to have those markers, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it if you didn't have that, you would end up having to recount 
each one of them and remember where all your divisions are. So on this row, I've created one, two, three, four, five, six interlocks for the seven blocks that we're going to have here. And then I'm going to change shed to go back the other way. On this row, since we've already created the interlocks right here, we don't need to do an interlock on this row right here. So we start over here with this one. Since it's already interlocked right here, we go back on that one, go through where, where, where the interlock is, go back through, weave in the white, and this is where you're going to, where, where it's the two colors are joined, so that's where you go to with your white. The same right here, you're going to go to where where the colors are are interlocked, put your fing fingers through the, uh, the shed, and work the brown through right here. Work the brown through because we've created the interlock on the previous row. right here. Right here. I'm going to change the shed. Now we're con on this row. We're going to create sh um, interlocks again. So we just re we're just going to repeat what we did on the previous row right here. We're working now that we establish where our divisions are. We don't have to use the markers up here that we did up up here. So what we're going to do is you you can visually see where the interlock is, and you just go in there and draw your first weft in. Right here. This color, the white color, is below the color that I just wove in here. You're still <coughs> allowing a bit of a bubble there so that you're, right. you don't start pulling in. So every other row is an inner interlock to create your vertical lines between the squares. I notice sometimes when I've made interlocks that I start getting a gap in between or right where the interlock is. Is that something you kind of have to look out for? You can control that by the tension of the um, the weft. If you're too, if this is too loose, you're going to start getting gaps in in, in between the uh, uh, the inner locking area mm -hmm. right here. And and you can by the tension of the the weft, you can have if you're if you're working it right, the tension is just right. Your vertical line will be right straight up okay. and down. If you pull, if you tend to pull one part too much and loose on the other part, your your um, your line is it's going to start to slant in one direction, the direction that you're pulling your weft string. 
You have a lot of things that you have to pay attention to, don't you, at the right. same time. It's a lot going on. And then we we'll would change the shed. I'm going to start on this side again because we're not interlocking on this row. Once you get the rhythm, you're going to go a lot faster. There's a lot going on in this row. You're paying attention to your, your edges. Make sure they're straight. You're interlocking on every other row, and you're not interlocking on every, every other row. And, and then you have to keep your, your, the tension of your weft um, even, uniform throughout so that your, your vertical lines are right straight up and down. If I went to, to the phone to answer the phone and came back and, and I noticed that they're not interlocking, then I know that in this shed I have to go back, I have to go start my interlocking again. If you notice the pattern, every time I go to my right, I'm interlocking. Mm -hmm. It may be different on your, your rug, depending on where you start it, how you start it, too. So basically, what's happening in between these two warps right here, where the colors join, is I have a dark and light colored weft right here. This is what's happening in between those two warps where they interlock. And this is what's happening in between the, uh, the a pair of warp where you interlock. If you run out of a color in between uh, uh, one of these squares right here, it can be here, 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 and you're going to pick up you're going to splice another color on. You break off the color that you're going to work and make sure it's feathered like this. And then you, you lay it right on top, not too far in. And we've added on where I ran out of the white right here. So those two overlapping joints essentially become the same thickness. Where I ran out of, out of the white right here and uh, put in the new color, essentially what I did is laid in the tapered end and laid this in on top so that the feathered ends are right on top of each other like this. That's, where, that's how you put in, add a new, a new um, weft in if you run out in the middle of your, your uh, it designed like this. I'm finished with this row of it, where, where I did my interlocks, change the shed, and this is the non-interlocking row. Right here, now we have, I've woven about uh, two inches on my squares right here. I'm going to end, it's a, I think I'm going to end my squares right here. So I'm going to have to break these here, all of these, and end them. And the way you end them is to go towards the way that there's, that you're not going to be interlocking on that row. So that's, I'm going to be, doing the, the lazy shed right here. Now is that the shed you were in or is this the a a different, shed? A you're different moving new to shed, the new yes. shed, okay. So I'm going to break these off, all of them. What I'm doing is twisting and pulling them apart and breaking all of the, the weft strings. So you have a feathered end, and it really doesn't cover the entire distance of the block, does it? It's just no, it doesn't, because you're, you're going to just work it in, taper it back in. OK, I broke all of those off. Now I'm going to work them back in. And y y you're not going to interlock right here, because these aren't long enough. So I'm just going to go back in and 
what I did is went in between where where the interlocks were. So and you, I'm working you wrapped that last uh, warp as though right. you were interlocking. Okay. And then as soon as we do this, get them all woven in, we're going to start our stripe. And we really don't even see that uh, that weft that went in there. It just disappears. Mm -hmm. My mom used to say, Yote will not come to your house. Yote to to nagancho ho ita to. And that means uh, the, the things that are worth having, the things that are worth working for that you want to acquire, uh, uh, things of value will not go to your house if, the, if it's messy. The same thing around, around your loom because um, you, won't, you, you, don't think in, you don't think in beauty when, when you have a messy surrounding. Now, since we didn't bring this, the, the feathered ends all the way over here, I'm ready to put in my brown stripe right here. So I'm going to take a piece of it, um, feather it out at the end. What I've done right here is I'm in the same shed that uh, when I put my in my feathered ends, I'm in that shed. So, so you're in the shed with everything it's still going this direction. Right. It's okay. going to be going in this direction if I had um, my one continuous um, weft string. So to feather this in, I'm going to manually pick up this side over here. Now when you do that, that's just as if you had changed right. sheds. But you're, instead of going through the whole process of changing, you're just manually picking up. Right. And I just feathered in a little bit and then work on across here. So this stripe is going in the same shed as all the feathered tapered right. ends. Because it didn't go all the way across, we still have to, we still have the uh, crisscross down here. Right. right here, right here, right here, right here. All the way across, they're, they're still crisscross. It's not an unused shed. And that's what we're using to go and put the stripe across start our stripe. So it's important that when you feather these ends out that they're very, very thin so you don't have two fat wefts in the same shed. Right. That, okay. And then here we're going to, um, you see, you're, you're starting to see uh, the, uh, the stripe right here. And we're going to, I'm going to weave in about, um, maybe a half an inch or an inch right here. And then we'll go into our, our next element of weaving in the diagonals. Now when you plan your design for a rug, Angie, do you get out your graph paper and sketch it all out to scale? No graph paper. No uh, graph paper. Su Suzanne, I, see. I, my, see. I think when I'm making the squares down here, I'm thinking ahead of what I'm going to do next after I put in my stripe or whatever I'm doing. I'm thinking ahead of, what's, of what I'm going to put in next. But since we already planned this out here, at, like the rug over there, after we put in our stripe, we're going to put in our diagonals. So you're right about here in right. terms of this design. Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my diagonals different than that, I'm going to put my uh, one from the center both this way. Oh, that's interesting. All of it this way, and then put a, uh, a triangle right in here. And it's going to be the same color of this brown one so that it'll go across and create, and, and then there's going to be another brown on top of the, tri uh, the diagonals. So you'll have this brown uh, forming the background in the triangle, and then there's going to be an, uh, well, a be brown nice. stripe up here. So you really sort of take a good look at your rug as you're weaving and plan it partially? I get a general idea of what mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing next, and then I start thinking about the colors. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use the same colors that I've used here and, and uh, 
and uh, mix them around. See. If it's too loose, you'll get the, the bulging out over here. If it's too tight, then your rugs start to go in like this. Now, do you think for a beginning weaver, they should take a tape measure and occasionally measure the width to be sure they're not pulling in? Is that? Yeah, if, if you take a tape measure as you, you're going up, Measure the base over here and over here, and go up to your weaving surface, and then measure like this, and this is right on. So when they're weaving up here, they can do it again right here, here, wherever you're, you're weaving. You can check yourself to make sure that the edges are, mm -hmm. are straight. Now, uh, Right here, before I go any further, I'm going to measure from the, ed the, uh, the edge right here to the top of my square. I'm doing this for a reason because when I get to the middle, I want to know how, how much I need to weave over the, the middle that I measured so that I, I consider the pack down uh, factor right here. So what I'm going to do is just measure from here to here, and it's uh, one, two, three, four. So as you continue weaving up here, the wool that you've already woven will continue packing down, right. even though it's down quite a bit below what you're weaving. Right. I see. So this is like uh, two and five eighths right here. And then when I weave in the, st uh, the stripe right here, maybe put another inch on there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to measure it again to see how, see how far it packed down. I see. So then I use that information up here in the middle and weave past my, my, the middle that I marked and uh, consider the, that the, the uh, weft is going to pack down that much. So as you get to middle, you're not going to stop your design at the middle. No. You will go beyond Be it a certain distance, knowing that that will continue right. to pack down. Right. Okay. So we have that information right there. Oh. Now, maybe you can show us your rug where you, <laughs> where you thought you were going to. My graph paper your rug? Your graph paper rug. All right. right. <laughs> Suzanne, tell us about this rug. Um, when you were weaving it, it seems like you... You uh, had, you didn't have enough space for uh, another row of houses, and you you fell short maybe about six inches right here, and. Uh, well, that's correct. This rug um, I started at home after our first class, and of course, you were nowhere in sight, and I carefully graphed this out. I had mathematical calculations all over the house, in terms of the number of warps needed. I had a paper cut out of the house and this was to have been like the schoolhouse quilts and the whole whole rug was just going to be houses. What I didn't do was pay attention to how much my weft packed down at, during this house or this house or this house and all of a sudden I got up here and finished the houses and thought, oh no, now what am I going to do with this space? As it turned out, it, I found something to put up there and it possibly is more interesting this way than it, if it had not been. But I learned a good lesson. I learned that pre-planning every design really isn't the way to weave a Navajo rug. That you need to pay attention and look at what you're doing and um, Watch how much the weft packs down. It, it's very hard to let go of the way I have learned to do things and shift in to the way you're planning this rug, where you're paying attention to what you're weaving now. You're thinking ahead a little bit, but you're allowing yourself some leverage to plan the rug as you go, which is not what I did here. It's really important that you learn how to repair a broken warp. This is broken. So you're actually leaving that string in. You're yeah. not just pulling I'm it out. I'm not going to pull it out because you're going to use the same area to pull, work your 
string through right here and this is the one that I'm going to be repairing right here. See this half set right here? Yes. It's moving moving back and forth yes. when I pull on one side. Okay, this is where you, you we use our curved needle. And I'm going to thread the, uh, the needle with my warp string. Now, have you actually cut off? You haven't cut off I a haven't piece of warp yet, have you? Cut it off yet. Still on the ball. I'm going to leave it on. And what I'm going to do is pick up the, two, the warp string that's broken and find out which turn it is. I need to repair these two, even though this one is broken. Pull the two and make sure I go in right through where the uh, the broken warp is going through so between the edging cord. Okay, right in and the edging cord. pull it cord. through. So you're still right on top of the old broken warp. Right, you don't remove that until you're you're finished with with fixing it. Just put it through where it was it was here. So it's going, going behind through, the lazy going through behind the lazy heddle and into one of the uh, pull oh, okay. the pull heddle. Mm -hmm. See right here. I see. Right here. So you're just following the same track as right. the broken warp. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here is the other broken end of it. And what I'm going to do is work the end back into the weave. This is the new warp that's the going? The new warp that's going in. Okay. How far down do you go? I'll just maybe take it down maybe two and a half inches. When you go down the same um, weave that the, the the previous warp went through, make sure that the the your your warp strain doesn't give that toothy look. You have to go in. See what I'm doing? It doesn't show right here. I'll leave this hanging right here, and take the other string. Make sure I have enough right here. So maybe an extra. Um, 12 inches or so and break this and thread this the other side, the other end through the needle. What I'm going to do right here is make sure I follow the broken, the other broken um, part of it and follow it through on the, this side of the uh, the um, lazy heddle, and it looks like it's going through in between the the pull cord. It's not going in the in turn the in between the turn. This this one is the other part right here. So I'm going to go in back through. about the same spot. Now I'm pulling this out. I'm done with this one. And continue on putting this one through. And down here Take the needle off and make sure, check the tension of it, tighten it by pulling down here at the same time. I'm going to tie these two, two ends down here. It's going to show during when you have your, your, your rug on the loom, but once you, you're, you're finished, you can work it in further down or 
uh, or uh, taper it off and work it back in into the into the weave itself and then you won't even notice that there was a repair see I didn't I didn't tie a knot right here to repair because I don't want to uh, work with knots in my warp strings so this is a, a repair job and I usually just let, let this hang uh, right here until I've woven further up this way and then uh, cut it later I'm going to do a uh, triangle right here. I think I'm going to give it maybe a, a base of um, eight. There's two in the center. So you're getting creative. You're not going to follow our design exactly here. You're going to uh, do your own I'm gonna, interpretation. I'm going to deviate from the, our sample design and do something different right here. So you can, after you learn all the elements, you can do whatever you, you want to with your design, interchanging the, the different elements, the different um, uh, elements that we were teaching you right here. So I'm in the, uh, a new shed right here. I have to change shed and go back to the spent shed, see there's no crisscross down here. Now wait, you are in the shed that the last brown row right. was in. Where did, you, where did you end that last brown row? Right here. Right there, okay. Okay, so I, I'm gonna take my center eight and just like we've done before down here, I'm gonna work in the uh, tail end of it. This is gonna be my brown triangle right here. And I think I, at this point, I'm going to use these three colors and the brown one here. Now, tell me again what you plan to do here so I fully understand. I'm going to put start with a triangle right here, and then there's going to be uh, diagonals, maybe three diagonals going this way, depending on what I count out. I but see. I want to maintain this brown as an edge over here. So th it will be one side of a triangle right here. So I think what I'm gonna do is maybe use this from here. From here, I'm counting in sets again from here. So one, two, three, four, five, Six. I think I, I'm. That's what I want my base to be. Six, Six sets. sets. Right. So I put in the. I'm gonna have my mark right here. So that's not. You're really not weaving that in. You're just not sort yet. of laying um, that in yes. as an idea as to how the design will work out. And then I think I'm. I'm gonna use the green right in this area right here. One, two three, four, five, six. Put the green here. And then I need a third color you right here. I think I'll use this one yeah. here. Oh, that's great. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right here. I think here at the edge, since I don't have a set of six, I'm just going to continue on with the brown right here. Well, that'll be interesting because this brown border will actually just continue up. It'll right. make a nice design element. And, and I didn't want this color to be close to this color, this one close to this color, and this one close to this color. So I kind of uh, well, that's very nice. Separated them. And then your center is going to be the dark brown. Right. They'll right? form the background of the, of the diagonals. And you'll repeat the same pattern on the other side. Do you lay that in now as well? Let's see. One, two, three. Three sets and, and three, three warps. Okay. One, two, three, and three warps. This is where I'm going to start my 
color right here and and we're we're still in the same shed as before we didn't change it that's where it's going to start and so then I'll go over one here one. and uh -huh. pick up uh, a one of the green colors and since I know that this is right here that's the start of my diagonal and I want six sets right here I'm going to go one two three, four, five, six. That's going to end this color, and this is going to start this green color. So I lay it in right in there. And then the brown goes in next. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is where my light brown goes in. Feather it in. And then I'm going to feather this in since I already have it marked off right here with this one. So everything's going in the same shed as the old brown, going the same direction. Right. Just feather this in right here because I already marked it out. And right here, I'm going to do the same thing. And I need to break a brown off right here. Now, I have all of my uh, uh, base of the colors for the diagonals woven in. I've got them started. Now I'm going to change my shed and lay in the first full row of, of my uh, diagonals. And here I'm just going to check my count because I know I have uh, three, three and a half sets three and, three. and one extra right. single warp. So one, two, three, half set and one extra. So I'm going to turn on the one that I, one extra warp. And show, then me, show me again your separation here where right here right in here that's the that's the count that I have right here one two three and a half set and one extra that's the one I turned on right here I put my finger in here and start counting and what I counted out in setting up the the uh, the diagonals was I wanted six sets. Okay, so from here, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the base of this color of my diagonal. So what I'm going to do is go in the shed and go around this one right here. It's already around that one right there, so I'm going to go in and put it through here. So if your, if your count had turned out to be six sets plus one extra warp, you could pick up the adjoining warp right. on your turn. And go around it this way. And sometimes I think you have to do that, is right. that right? Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to count from here to pick up my next set, and I'm going to have six sets right here, six sets of warps. One, two, three, four, five, six, and it's going to it's doing the same thing as the previous one. It's already around that the one that I want it to go around. That makes my full six sets, and go in. Now you're to the triangle, aren't you? So the right count. And I made uh, this is going to be two sets right here, one, two. Um, around the one that I want to go around. See right here. I want to put my finger in here, go through the shed, and and uh, put the uh, weft through the shed. The same thing from here. Pick up right where that turn is 
and I'm going to start with the base of this diagonal again, just like I did over here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it's already the, around the one that I want to go around. The, the weft is going around this count of six complete sets. And then... So because you have an even number of sets, it will all... It'll, it'll all be the same all, all the, the way same. across mm -hmm. because I have an even number of sets in each one of my diagonal. And I, I should have three and a half sets plus one extra. So one, two, three, one half, and one extra. So I have uh, the count is right. Now I've laid in my first, the bases of my, my diagonals. I'm going to change the shed. Now I'm going to start with this brown over here, the edge color over here, and start going back the other way in a different shed. Right here, since this was a feathered point, I'm going to turn on this point right here in, in this six sets right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to turn on that one here. Right here. One, two, three, four, five, six turn on that one. Turn on eight right here. And then the edge color. Okay, so I've done the second row. Now when you weave this next row, each, this side is not going to be the same as this side. Is that correct? Right, because they're going, th these are, these two colors are going to be going this direction. These two are going to be going this direction. So Angie, the diagonals on your rug are not all going to be going the same direction. The ones on your right will be going this way you're breaking up the middle with the triangle, and the ones on your left will be going this direction. Exactly. Is that correct? Exactly. So we have to keep our wits about us. Right. So I'm through taking the colors here uh, on the diagonals through, and all strings are going in this direction. Now I'm going to change the shed. And I'm going to start from here again because we're not working the, uh, the weft strings against each other. We're not inter interlocking right here. So right here, I'm going to start with the brown here. And you're turning on the same warp that you turned on before. Right, before because I, right down here, it wasn't a full turn. We, we did um, taper this one in, so there's, um, it's not a full turn on that one. So it's just a feathered, a right, very thin a, weft that right. went around that first mm -hmm. warp. And if, if you do that, you're not going to see your point if, you, if I had turned on this one the last time. So now I'm, I'm kind of, I'm doubling up on this one so you can see the point. Over here, on what this side of my diagonals, I made a full turn on the last shed. So I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start increasing on this one over here on the brown right here. See, here's the 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 turn on the brown, this light brown right here. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to start working out on this side. So what I'm going to do instead of picking up the 8 or the 4 on this side and the 4 in the back, I'm going to pick up an extra one. So I'm really stepping out uh, and picking up one extra one. And this is going to be my point of this diagonal, and it's going to work out like this. So on this next one right here, the width on the light brown, I'm going to go over one on the green right here. So you're picking up the adjoining warp. Right. To now, the, to the cover the, uh, the point of my diagonal right here. And uh, if, if I count from here, right here, in sets of four, remember I have um, six sets right here. And starting with this, the new point that I put this one on, I'm going to have six sets right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. See, this is where the brown picks up, and I have six sets right here. Now, if you get confused and you get off, you can always stop and go back and count, can't you? Right. To make sure where you are. I picked up one extra on, on, on this one over here. When I'm increasing on this side, I'm dropping one over here. I see. When I'm done with this, all the, the weft strings are going in this direction. And now um, I'm going to change the shed again right here. Start over here on this side. The turns are right next to each other right here. So if I had missed one and did this, you're, you're, this one's not going to be covered by the brown right in here. So you're wrapping every warp every string. Every warp string. This one right next to the one that I have the green on over here, that's the one it turns on right here. Right in here. See, this is the one next to the green right here. That's the one I want to turn on. Right here, I, I need to add another piece of brown. And just taper it in right here. This one goes around closest to the one that this brown is on. So it, I'm going to pick up this one And at the same time, I'm picking up one over here because it's, it's slanting this way. I picked up one over here on this brown. I picked up another one on this brown. So each change of shed, this pattern has, has differed. You, uh, it's going to be different. You have to pay attention to what's going on down here. So I'm going to turn on the one that's right next to this dark brown. And it's on this side right here. That I'm using the, uh, the pull shed. And it's going to go in here across. And at the same time, I picked up one string because I'm increasing by one over here. And the turn is right here right next to each other right here. This is the dark brown over here, and I've dipped my turn on this next one. On this one, I'm going to be, I increase before over here onto the light brown, and I'm going to start increasing over here on the light brown, one thread, at, one warp at a time. And so this row now starts increasing like that. Right. Did. Okay. And then I increase by one over here. I'm going to pick up this one and turn on this one going back this way. This one I increase by one on the green 
So this is the one that I'm going to turn on going in this direction. The green's going to go one step, one warp onto the brown right here. So it stacks right onto the orangey brown yeah, there. Right. This one goes one turn onto the brown right here. The brown goes out right here, right next to the turn that I made before right there. You make a turn on every warp going this way and going this way on the brown. And, and uh, on this one here, you're going to make a turn on every one going in this direction too, on every warp. But each row won't be the same as the one that you previously did. I think that's what's so confusing right. to students, is that the pattern changes. If they pay attention of what's going on down here, then they, they won't miss a turn right there. Mm -hmm. Because it's very confusing for beginning students to keep track of the diagonals going in separate directions on the same row. I'm just going to work from here to there and do a lazy line right here where, where the triangle is going to be naturally in here anyway. So I'm just going to work one section. This is a very good technique to use if you're working on a very wide rug where you have to work in sections. You can pick up that technique right here. And you want to use it where there's a natural separation of two colors that's going up in an angle like this. You don't want to use it in, in right here in the, where you have one solid color. You don't want to put a lazy line right here. I can complete this diagonal and then later fill in over here. So I'm just going to start right here and start working with the, these diagonals on the right side. You saw me using the, the sharp end of my uh, weaving fork. That's too. When I pulled on this, I pulled it a little bit too much, and I strummed it with the, the tail of my weaving fork. And that's to, to go back and relax the, uh, the weft string so that I don't have that much pull on it. I'm dropping one, actually if you think about it that way. Mm -hmm. And then I'm picking up over here on this one because the diagonal is going to be going this way. So I'm going to, this is my last turn right here on this one. The next one's going to be on this one over here. The turn goes right here next to this brown one. So I need to go in, put my finger where I'm going to be going over to the brown picking that one up and going in right next to this brown turn right here. I have to be careful when I'm doing the di diagonal, uh, the lazy line right here. Make sure that I don't turn twice on the same warp. I'm stepping in like this and turning on every warp. I'm going to lift this up right here. See how how I'm um, turning on every every warp it has every a turn. warp has a turn right here. I'm through with these diagonals over here and here I created a lazy line with making a turn on every one of the warps right here going in this direction. And I'm going to go over here and fill in with, uh, with the, starting with the triangle here going out this way. 
and uh, fill in the rest over here. We're going to look at the lazy lines on this antique yay rug back here. Uh, the yay rug was woven with this as the bottom. These would be the sides, so the weft was put in this way. Is that correct, Angie? Right. And I noticed there are lazy lines laced throughout this particular weaving without any particular um, thought about where they were placed. This would be your diagonal, the same as this diagonal, and yet there's a lazy line right next to it, which is interesting. If you were weaving, you probably would have used this diagonal as your lazy line oh, right. and uh, not had one right next to it. You don't use lazy lines, though, like this at all, do you? No, I don't go through a solid color like this. I use the, the natural um, color uh, diagonal uh, th where the, the two colors are joining edge, right here, the here. edge of a diagonal. That's where I, I usually put my, my lazy lines so they don't show up after I fill in on the other side. Mm -hmm. Right here, I filled in the where I had the lazy line right here. I'm through filling in on, on this side of the diagonal on the left side. So I'm now ready to, to end my diagonals. So I, I, what I did was I have two left over here. This is going to be my background color. Since I was ahead on this side, I'm going to be ending the colors over here first. So what I'm going to do is break the strings right here. Leave this intact over here because I still need one turn over here. Now, Angie, you're finished on this side, but you're not finished on this side. Is that correct? Right, because we were ahead on this side. So I have, as you can see, I have two browns over here, which I'm going to take to this point to, to the three, third warp right here. Over here, I still have to make a turn on this third warp. So coming back this way on the next shed, I'll be ending this, this, di these diagonals over here. I see. So I'm going to change my shed right here. And I'm just going to tuck in these little tails right here going this direction. You always tuck all your ends in so you never have anything hanging out on either side, do you? A, a good weaver never has anything sticking out, no weft on the back or in, in the front. You always tuck in your the weft. The, the weft. Uh, to the very end of the, the feathered end. Right here, I'm, I'm just going to go turn on the last two right here. On this one, I'm going to run it all the way across. The last one on this side that I want to go around uh, with the uh, brown. go all the way across. Now I'm going to do this part over here. So you're picking up the last the one. The last one to the point of the diagonal. So I have two left over here. Now I'm going to break these. That's one of those hand-dyed wefts that gets a little stiffer. And just do the two right here. And then I'm going to change shed. Work these little tails in here. Since I turn on a half a set right here, and this is coming in from here. I'm going to, I already changed my shed, and I'm just going to tuck this little tail in here on, in the new shed. And that's 
feathered out and quite right. thin, is it not? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Right. So um, what I'm going to do right here is go all the way out as if I was in a different shed with this one over here, through here, and back in the same shed as the feathered end that I, the little feathered end that we put in there. So that's. So they're both one on top of another there. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I ran out of weft right here. I'm going to add another. That's a wonderful way to end that. It's when you only have two warps that are wrapped. That's a tough thing to do to get rid of that weft. Over here on this side, I'm going to I'm going to go all the way across over here. I, I just have enough to go over to to the last two mm -hmm. on, on the brown right here. So we're not going to do what we did over here. I'm just going to thin it out a little bit so that it goes all the way across. Did you intentionally plan that so that uh, it no, oh. I'm working with what I what what's uh, how it's presenting itself. I'm going to take this all the way across. Now it looks like it's there's only one. Become uh, one with the yeah, other one. Mm -hmm. It becomes, it tapers into the other one over here. Now I'm going to go change shed again and just go across on with one weft. Look how interesting this design is becoming. This brown stripe is moving right up into the uh, diamond or the uh, triangle. And on the edges, it's changing the whole look of the pattern now. I think right here I'm going to, uh, previously I measured from here to here to see how much it packed down. Oh. So we have more than an inch since we, we measured here. So what I'm going to do in, is quickly measure here to find out how much the weft uh, packs down. Oh, sure. It only went down one eighth of an inch. Really? Which tells me that the weft spacing and the size, the, the warp spacing and the size of the, uh, the weft are just right for each other. Um, if if it packed down like maybe uh, a fourth of an inch, then we're, we're using uh, a weft string that's too, too thin for the warp spacing. Nice. When will you cut that broken warp string? I think we can cut it right now. If you if you'll cut that part I of it. We can cut the back part of it. We're just going to snip it off right at the, you, you, there. Now I think at this point we're going to uh, weave in a stripe up at the top right here. Now why do you do that? I do that because um, it helps with your warp spacing. So we want to lock the spacing of the warp right here at, at on the, the top end. And what I'm going to do right here in order to do that, I'm going to, we're going to weave right over here and I have to flip this thing right here, the, um, the lazy heddle on this side so that my weaving will be on this side. So what so I'm going to do mm -hmm. is just go through the, the lazy shed, take this out and put it on the other side of the, uh, the pull heddle. Now I'm ready to, to um, to weave in my stripe at the top. Angie, we have turned the loom upside down, which makes it easier for you to weave in the top of the warp. But how do you know which shed to put the first row of weft in? Just like we did at the bottom part right here, which is now at the top part. Uh -huh. We're going to go in on the crisscross uh, shed, so which would be the pull shed down here. 
I'm going to take this down to the bottom so that you'll see where the, the crisscross is right down here. I see. So it's the same thing that we did at the uh, bottom, which is now the top. Right. Now, when I, when I finish this row up here, I know I was going in, in, going, going in to the right. And is this is it was in a crisscross row as well? This this weft here? Yes, it, it is. It is a crisscross row going to to the right. If it was flipped around, it would be going to my my left. So, I I just need to start here, going the same direction in the same shed as the top one. So this is our first row in with the tail sticking out. I'm going to put in the second row, work the tail back in here so it's not hanging out. Making sure that you're, you have the, the right tension on your weft. It's not too loose or it's not too tight. Right here, there's a big, big um, weft coming out. So I just pick it up, stretch it a little bit, and start with my bubbles a little bit smaller. I'm also showing you the use of the wooden needle here. On on uh, doing on a solid stripe here. How far up will you weave here? I'm gonna put in probably three or th maybe four or five rows of solid brown. This ought to make it a lot easier when you close up the rug also to have this part pre-woven. It will be because um, when you when you get up to towards the top it's very difficult sometimes to to weave to weave in this this row on top working it in upside down. So this will help you um, finish up a lot easier. It's nice that you gave yourself a little slack on these markers. If they were too tight, you'd have difficulty, wouldn't you? Right. You wove in the top. You, you make them loose so that you can, if you need to work on this side or if you need to repair a warp, you can go through the markers and you can slide them up and down the, the um, back and forth on the on the warp. So how do you weave in the top if you don't have someone standing here holding the loom upside down for you? I would uh, lean it against a, a, a post or a wall so that it doesn't it doesn't um, fall over on my head. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's how much I would weave in. Then what do you do with the end there? I'll, I'm just going to tuck it in here, right here. We uh, flip the, the loom back on, 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 the f on its feet, back to the right side. Okay. So what we're going to do is, remember we had the uh, lazy heddle on this side to weave up on top. So I'm going to flip this, put this back on, back over here on the other side of the uh, pull shed. So I'll just take this up to 
to create that shed. Oh, yes. Go in with the batten stick, take this out, and put it back over here. There. So now we're back where we started from. Right. You know, Angie, I was just wondering, <clears throat> we have the markers for the blocks, but we didn't ever put any markers in for the diagonals. Oh, we can do that now. Oh, we can? Mm-hmm. Okay. So we, we started from the base of the diagonal right here, but we're not going to, we're not going to use that as a marker up here because if you're going this way and th this is the first, the first angle you're going to pick up right here, over here on this side. So we're going to use the top part of the, the diagonal to mark our, to put our markers in over now here. Now is that because we're doing a mirror image right, right. and it's, the design is just flipping over. Right. So what I remember my point going to leaving the the uh, two the last two the last two mm -hmm. warps right here. So and I remember having six sets. Six sets. So I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, six sets. Go up over to here and put my marker right here. I'm not going to use the same red marker because we don't want to get confused right here and pick up the wrong marker for, for the diagonals. So red is for blocks and green is for the diagonals. Right. And then count off another so you know exactly where to start your colors. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. You won't waste any time with counting the sets for your diagonals and your middle triangle right here. So I think right now we're going to, we're going to be discussing what elements or what design we're going to be putting in here. And I'm going to do something similar to what you did over here on, on this rug. We're going to put in this step right in here on the two edges of this rug right here. And we're going to start the diamond right here. I already marked these two center warp. Okay. This is going to be the same color as the background mm -hmm. color. And I, I want to probably match my, my border on my steps, the width. So I'm going to pick up one, two for every step. How many steps are you going to make? I think I'll make um, four because in your rug you had one make room for one more step and go even closer into the um, into the diamond. I picked up the first eight two sets for my first step and then I'm going to pick up the new eight the uh, next eight for my next step two sets for my uh, third step, then two, two, two sets for my fourth step. So th these are, this is how, why, how wide the base is going to be for my steps so right this, here. So you're talking about this distance right, right here. So I think this, I'll make this dark brown right here. So each of these steps, and this step, and this step, and you're adding a fourth one, has the same number of warps in it. Right. And then counting from here in, I have two sets for my, my border right here. And then each step, I'm going to pick up two sets. Right here is the base of my, my steps. And then here, the middle, the center pair of warp, I think I'm going to do, start the, uh, the diamond in the uh, green. So you start the point of the diamond on two warps. On two warps, because mm -hmm. we have even sets. Okay. 
even an even number of um, warp strings. Okay. So that's what I'm what I'm gonna do, and I'm in the already in the. Uh, uh, let's see. I need to go in the uh, shed that I had used before, going in this direction. So I have my marked. So the last row of this, you're in the same shed as the last row of this um, off-white color. Right. I'm going to, right here, when, when I start the uh, tip of the diamond, I need, a, I need to use the f a figure eight between, between the two center warps to anchor it down and make sure the feathered end is all the way in. So that's what I'm doing right here. So you can go back and forth quite a few times. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's feathered, and if you just go once this way, you're not going to see the point mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the diamond. Right here is going to be the base of my brown, so I need to start the background color right in here. And I have my the point of my diamond mm -hmm. right here going in this direction. I have to start also the background color. Right here. And before I take this out, I'm going to start the border over here in the background color right here. And let's zip this out and go in here. That's where I'm starting. Okay, so we laid in all our colors for right on top of the right existing. on top of the existing shed. Mm -hmm. And um, and we're gonna change our shed. We're going to be mixing um, interlocks and diagonals on mm. one row right here. Sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start with this tan one over here. And we remember to wrap every warp, I guess, again, as we go by a diagonal. Just like we did down here with the diagonals down here. All right. And one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm just checking my count here. Mm -hmm. This is going to go in here. And I've created an interlock right here because the base is going to go vertical up. And the border. Here. It's another interlock. Another interlock. After I do that, I'm going to go over here, and I'm still working on the, the uh, point of my diamond. The same two center. The same two center. I have to work this one against the brown. And I, I had two sets of two sets right here at, uh, for the border. And this is going to go right here. I would check my count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is where I'm going to put my tan color up to the point of the uh, diamond here. Okay, now we started our colors here for the diamond and the uh, steps. And I'm going to change the uh, shed because we have all of our weft strings going this way. Mm -hmm. Now that we have our interlocks at the, these points, I'm going to start over here and work this way because we don't have to create interlocks on this row. Okay, 
right here, we just go to the point, the one net right next to uh, the center pair, and turn on that one right in here. Right next to those two center right. warps. Mm -hmm. Here I'm going to start increasing this way. So instead of going around the original two that I started with, I'm going to pick up one. Now you can increase and there because you have wrapped that warp that's adjoining right. the two centers. I, I wrapped this one right here going that way in the, in the last shed. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going this way, so I'm going to pick up one to increase by one this way. And th th this angle is going to go in the right direction, this way here. So your diamond is really just like the diagonals that you did below, except that you're increasing on both sides. And on both sides. Right here, I'm going to go over and pick up one more here. Right here. So we're going to continue weaving until, until we have we have enough for the step to go in right here, and the diamond is going to continue to increase on both sides, like this. We have enough brown to make the first step this way, so that's what we're going to be doing right here. And I'm in the um, when I'm st when I'm stepping in on this step right here over two sets. I'm gonna put it in in the same same shed that I went this way on. So, since we have an interlock right there, if I just went over and and did this on top of the brown. So in other words, you just. In this method, you've just carried it straight yeah, across. Yeah, carried it right straight across, but right here it doesn't look right. So I'm going to take it back out, and because I'm going over to on the brown in the same shed, I'm going to thin this one out right here, and pick up my two sets on my brown that I'm going to be stepping in right here. And I'm going to go around this last tan warp that I had right here, this last one on the tan, and go around that warp and put it on through. And that just gives you a clean square right here. Looks very nice, yeah. So it looks just like the interlock below it. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have a brown and a tan in the same shed. Right. You can't even tell that I have it in the in the same shed. No. And I'm gonna since all of all of my strings are my weft are going in this direction, now I'm gonna change my shed. And I'm gonna start working over here since the interlock was on the in the last row. And right here, I'm going to kind of thin this out because I'm going to be stepping over right here, too. Oh, so you thin out the brown that, yes. that is under the stepped out part as well. Now, right here, there's going to be no interlock. So I'm just going to run this tan color right over across this way. I'm not going to do like I did over here I see. because this is, was on an interlock and this is not. So I'm going to uh, stretch this one out just where it's going to go over the brown. And this is a diagonal, so I'm, pu I'm, putting, it, I'm putting it around the last warp that's uh, right on the tip of this diamond right here, this way. And then I'm going to pick up my first step which consists of two sets. 
and go right straight through there. See how clean it is? Yes. And I didn't have to go around that last tan warp right here uh -huh. because I, it, it was not interlocking over here. Now right here, I think we're ready, also ready to start our inner diamond. And we're just going to do what we did down here. We're going to, I have the tapered end of this um, orange color weft. Put it in right there. And if I'm, I'm going to do a figure eight between the two center warps to anchor this down. I think I have enough right there. And put the green color back in right here. So right here, we're going to have a green outer border on this diamond. And we're going to, we're going to have an inner diamond that, that will um, be orange on, on, in this center right here. We have a general idea of that the diamond is going to slant like this. If, if I wanted to have this diamond go out to the edge and just keep on have making diamonds within diamonds, I can do that. That would be interesting, too. And, and you'll have uh, stripes going out this way, mm -hmm. all the way off the rug. So when this gets bigger right here, I'm going to decide whether I want another inner diamond or a solid center maybe put in putting in another design right here like the one we have over there. Angie, when you get to the center, assuming this is center, how would you handle decreasing this diamond? I would start decreasing first on the side that I was increasing first first and uh, that would be my my first step when I reverse my my designs and then that's just a mirror image of what you did from here and you just reverse your designs and do the mirror image on the side on this the upper side of your center well once you learn how to do your interlocking once you learn how to do the stripe and the diagonal and uh, the diamond and the, the stepping in and the stepping in those are the four elements we taught, uh, we were teaching here. If you learn all of those, the, the, the possibilities are endless of what you can, you can do with those elements and, and design your rug. And as you go along, you can, uh, you can even change your mind and make, make uh, the, the, um, the steps a little bit uh, narrow right here instead of white steps right here. Well, what I've learned from you is just this very process is to stop and take a good hard look at what we have, what's working, what we like, how our spaces work out. And it's, it's a different way for me of thinking. It's very, very exciting, I think. Mm -hmm. Right now, we, when we get to the middle right here, like um, we only have um, like it packs down like an eighth of an inch. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so we, know we that only need to go like maybe two or three um, rows beyond our true middle right here where we marked, and, and, uh, and it should pack down to the, the true middle. So we have to keep that in mind when we weave along towards the middle. So you're always kind of focusing on where your middle is as you build your design up. Mm -hmm. It might help to step back and, and look at it mm -hmm. to make sure that you, you're, you like your design and the colors that you're putting together. Mm. I think this is a good stopping point right here. And uh, I learned from my mother to whenever you're going away uh, to do something, that you gather up your, all your weft, put it around your finger and store it in, tuck it in the, um, in the uh, warp here. So that, so that they're not stringing down. And we do that with all, even the smallest one. And she, my mom used to say that if you leave your 
weft string hanging down, the lazy people are going to come and undo all your weaving. <laughs> Is so, that right? Yeah, right. And so that's why we, we tuck it in, in, in here. And, and uh, she also learned not to uh, leave my batten stick yeah. in the um, uh, loom. We take it out and store it right here with our weaving fork. Can you come over to this loom and show us how to finish the top of this? With my metal needles, I like to uh, use nylon cord on it, draw it through the eye of the uh, needle right here, and tie it. There's a little tie right here. After we tie it, we burn it and, and melt it uh, down like this. So it's, it's really small. So when I draw it through the warp string, it doesn't um, get caught on, on the warp. As we get closer and closer to the finishing part of this rug right here, we, we only have like an inch and a half on this rug to go to finish. And we've already reduced the uh, lazy heddle several times from, from a, a bigger heddle and then a smaller heddle. And now we're using uh, the, one of the metal wires for our, our lazy heddle right here. So I'm going to try to go in with a metal needle and use my pull shed. And it's really hard to do. I have to really pull on it to use the pull shed. So now it's time to, time to take the, the lazy uh, heddle out. I'm going to take this out. And let's see what which which shed I should be working in. Let me use the try to pull. Yeah, I'm gonna be doing the pull heddle right here. So what I'm gonna do since all the uh, strings are going in this direction, I'll go over here and start working in sections right here. I'm gonna go over here and do the the pull heddle. It's a lot easier to to use the pull heddle without the um, without the uh, the lazy heddle in there. It's going to be pretty slow from here to the finishing because you're going to be manually doing it, and it's you're going to be using your needle to get your weft strings through. You still pack this down pretty tightly, don't you? I started here? packing this really hard, mm -hmm. down really hard from here, mm -hmm. because I, I don't want to, I want, I want enough packing on both sides, here and here. When I get close to finishing, I can just um, push up on this one and push down on this one and close it in right there. Now I'm going to take this out and go to the next section and work right here. We don't have any fringes on, on Navajo rugs. You have to finish it all the way to the end. Now, at some point, I guess you're going to have to remove this um, pull heddle, too, won't you? Yes. When, when I can no longer pull the, uh, the uh, pull heddle like this to put my needle through, then I also take the, the, sh the uh, pull heddle and the pull, pull sh uh, heddle string out. And then both sets are going to be created manually from there. Very, very easy to start pulling the edges mm -hmm. in at this point, don't you think? You're right. Uh, you have to be aware that you have to go really slowly and ma make sure that the edges don't start going in. Uh, right here, I'm going to start um, picking this out manually because we don't have the uh, lazy heddle in there anymore 
to, to do the, the lazy shed, so I'm going to do this manually. I'm using my thumb here to uh, push this back and pick up the back warp like this. How much time would it take you to finish this? Less than an inch? Probably all day. Mm. If, if, if I'm going to do a good job on it. One of the things that she told me was, um, don't ever sleep by your rug. Because when you wake up, you, you feel tired. You feel confused. You feel uh, you need to wake up. And that's not the way. Uh, uh, the way of the Navajo weaving uh, is done. It, it's done when you're alert and when you're uh, thinking good thoughts and and and, uh, and uh, go sleep someplace else and don't sleep by your rug. Now you have a fairly rigid needle there, don't you? Right. It's not flimsy, so that's good. This is where that very fine nylon thread comes in handy, doesn't it, to attach to the end of the needles? If you didn't have that on there, you're going to be uh, threading your needle every time you, you pick up a different web string. I can certainly see why you want to finish in a stripe, a solid color, right. not have to finish a rug in a design pattern area like that, that would be. Some rugs you see that the stripe, uh, the border stripe is like almost four inches. So that so they you'd would be have finishing to finish fast, right down. Right, away. probably right from here. Mm. And right now we're going to remove the pull handle. I don't want to break a warp string, uh, string at this point, so I'm going to cut all the way across right here and actually pull the uh, uh, the uh, loose ends or the loose ends right here. In the very early days of weaving before you could even purchase a cotton twine, did they spin their own? Uh, what the, did they use? Th they spun their own. Uh, they they use like an, an edging cord. A very fine uh, right. Out of, made out of wool? Made out of wool, hmm. but uh, they didn't do fine rugs back then. They're, they probably did saddle blankets, and at that time, the um, spun pull heddle was, was okay, worked okay. For the pull heddle and the lazy heddle, I have to do it manually both ways. Let me measure here. Down here, I'm going to measure how, how, uh, the width of my square down here, or the height of my square. It's two inches. And this is, I need, I need probably uh, five-eighths of an inch to go right here to make the square right here. So I have uh, that much more to weave on my, my, my blocks right here before I can start start weaving from both sides with uh, with the uh, with the brown I'm going to show you how to um, uh, put in the final few rows on my sister's rug here the strings are over here yeah and, and I'm just going to work from half or a fourth and then put the two on through and then go to the next section go to the next section, go to the next section. Okay, so every one of them is alternating. And this is the hardest part. When you, when you have your strip, uh, your stripe like this, that's when you have to uh, start packing it down really hard because even though you have a little space in there, you can still stop right there and and um, and and uh, push this up. So you have pack, when you pack it down, and then when you push it up, it looks like it, you 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 finish it all the way to 
to the very end where you, you can just thread one thread through. And I'm using this sacking needle to push it, push this down. The side I'm going to pull the thread through. So in the same shed, you're putting two threads in there, one from the top and one from the bottom. The reason why you're putting two of them in there is you're going to, when you put the last one through, you're just going to put one back through in the middle so you, uh, it's an, in a different shed and you don't have two in one shed. Push this one up and do the bottom one. When you remove your, your pull shed, that's when you start weaving in from the top and from the bottom. You don't want to put a, a weft string in the same shed that you went in before, or else you're going to see the, the warp strings coming through if you have two in the same shed. But in some tapestries, you, and if you, the design starts way from here, and you only have that much, and you have a, a, an area where you might want to finish in the middle. I've done that on several rugs. I, I usually finish right in the middle. So this gets really difficult for the, uh, the needle to go through. You have to be very, very patient when you're finishing, finishing a rug. A well-finished rug, you can't tell where you started and you finished. And this is one of those rugs that uh, you, you won't be able to tell which, which, which side the, the weaver started and which side they ended. And uh, some weavers do, when they're finishing a, a, finishing a rug, they'll try to go through two, go, go around two of them at a time. And you can tell when you pick up a rug that they're not done uh, correctly because towards the finish and somebody got impatient because this will be twice as thick towards the, uh, the ending. And I think this is going to be our last row. It's so difficult to put that um, needle through. This is going to be our last two going in that direction. And then we're going to put one through the middle, and that's where we're going to be finishing up. Okay. Now we're going to put in our last row right here. I'm going to use a, a small sacking needle. And you just want to do maybe five, depending on the the what you're comfortable with, and put the last row back through the middle. Oops. Don't don't tighten it up right here. And you don't want to go all the way like this. You just hold it and just get a section of it through at a time. 
because if you pull it all the way out, it's going to break on you. The weft string is going to break on you. With this last row, you can you can see through here that you can you can see the the warp strings. And I'm going to do a little magic right here after I get this through. So right here, because there's it's extra packed right here, then you go up like this. And this moves it up. And from here you go like this. This is my sister's rug, May. She's sitting back in, in the back of the rug, making sure that I'm doing it right. And uh, I'm not sabotaging her weaving and her finishing. And uh, th this is a time when relatives come around and, and see the finish, uh, finished product. And a lot of relatives, because it's hard work, and a lot of relatives uh, help out. That's what I'm doing right here. I'm helping her finish the, the rug. And, uh, and she, uh, as, as you can see, she's inspecting back there. <laughs> and uh, she'll probably tell me if I, if I miss a, a, a warp string or tell me to undo something if I goof up. I'm almost done. This has a, a bigger tip so I can pick up the uh, warp without going through it and I can see it. If I use a much thinner needle, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to go through the uh, warp. Okay, to tuck this back in, taper it off uh, and push it up a little bit. And then you're going to, you're not going to put it back through where you, where the, the, the the yarn went out, you push it up and then go through a different area to kind of weave it back in. There. Oh. There. We're going to just taper it off and then weave it back in. And we let the little kids do this sometimes and make them feel like they're helping out, taking the, the, the lacing um, out. Yeah. <laughs> Didi-gi-kwa-e-njunu-go-t-na-hati-zong-so-e-e-hot-e-hlata-e-do-ji-gyesh-le-hlata-e-ji-gyesh-le-hlata-e-ji-gyesh-le-hlata-e-ji-g
it was scarce, and, and uh, she'd use it over and over and save everything. Yes, it, back then you had to spin this. This is spun just like the edging cord, and you, you don't want to cut it, cut it up. You use it over and over again. And when you take it off, the first thing you do is you go outside with it, shake the rug outside, and turn to the uh, south with it and bring it back into the house. You never turn to the north with it because south is a, a good direction. Everything good comes from the south. And even in ceremonies, when you go out, when the ceremony is finished, you go out for a short period of time, take in some clean, fresh air, and, and then you turn to the south and come back into the hoga. We wish to extend a very special debt of gratitude to Angie Walker Maloney for sharing with us her family's tradition of Navajo weaving. As you use these Navajo techniques to create rugs of your own design, we know you will honor and respect the Navajo tradition. And remember, an authentic Navajo rug can only be created by a Navajo weaver using those traditional techniques that have been passed down through the family from generation to generation. <laughs>